we're ready to begin, though, it just so happens. So let's open in prayer before we look at tonight's Bible study. Uh, Father, before we come to you, you, well, we come to you now before we study your word together. And we thank you for your word, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit, and we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. And we ask that you would give us deeper understanding and deeper wisdom and knowledge of your word. Help us to put it into practice every day. Help us, Lord, to grow in Christ's likeness. Help us to let go of the things of this world and to grab on to the things of heaven, which are your things. Uh, lead us tonight. Bless us by your word and our study in it, in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight is Psalm 76. Uh, we've had several people mention to me that this was a confusing psalm to them for people who had done some pre-reading. And so hopefully this will be a good study to help take away any confusion about this what this says. Like no, nope, this one is the one. And so this will be a, another psalm where the psalmist is going to open up by focusing on, on God and on how God defends and protects his people. And it's going to be describing how uh, people react to God defending his people. And then it's going to end up being... Uh, another recalling psalm where um, it will be recalled what God is, his characteristics, what he does, who he is. And then this will lead to praise. And that's really what you find in a lot of these psalms is that it leads and ends to praise. It leads to our encouragement. It leads to our uh, strengthening. And it, that leads us to praise God. The remembering of who he is and what he's done leads us to praise him. And that's a that's the natural reaction to God and the things of God. So the subtitle of Psalm 76 is, Who Can Stand Before You? To the choir master with stringed instruments, a psalm of Asaph, a song. In Judah, God is known. His name is great in Israel. His abode has been established in Salem, his dwelling place in Zion. There he broke the flashing arrows, the shield, the sword, and the weapons of war, Selah. Glorious are you, more majestic than the mountains full of prey. The stout-hearted were stripped of their spoil. They sank into sleep. All the men of war were unable to use their hands. At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both rider and horse lay stunned. But you, you are to be feared. Who can stand before you once your anger is roused? From the heavens you uttered judgment. The earth feared and was still. When God arose to establish judgment to save all the humble of the earth, Salem, surely the wrath of man shall praise you. The remnant of wrath you will put on like a belt. Make your vows to the Lord your God and perform them. Let all around him bring gifts to him who is to be feared who cuts off the spirit of princes, who is to be feared by the kings of the earth. And that's it, 12 verses in Psalm 76. So let's break it down. First question asks about the subtitle. What does who can stand before you mean? It says, who can stand before you to the choir master, with stringed instruments, a psalm of Asaph, a song. What does it mean when the psalmist says, who can stand before you? Who's the you that this is referring to in the first place? God. So he's asking, who can stand before God? What's that mean? Um, who, is, who is worthy or, or no one is worthy? Like, what about the word stand? When it says stand, do you, we're not necessarily thinking worthy as much as who can stand against, who can oppose. Who can stand against God? Who can oppose him? Who can tell him no? Who can, who can stand up to God's great power? And this makes, we ask ourselves, you know, is that the right answer? Well, we look at the rest of the context of the psalm, and it's talking about the enemies against God and how God rallies against them and how God protects his own people. So then it comes down to um, having kind of like end times overtones when God will defeat his enemies, God will bring all those who are against him into judgment, um, so it has that kind of an overtone to it, which is terrifying to those who are against God, but very encouraging to those who are putting all their faith, hope, and trust into him. So it's just a question of who can stand before you? Who, who can stand against you? Who can stand before you? Who can stand against you? Same idea. 
What about question two? Several places are named in verses one and two. What are they and what do they mean in these verses? The, there's four of them, okay? And it says, if we just read through verses one and two, we can get nail them right as we go. It says, in Judah, so that's the first one, God is known. The second one comes right after that. His name is great in Israel. That's the second place. In verse 2, it says, His abode has been established in Salem, and His dwelling place is in Zion. So there's your four places that are named in verses 1 and 2. Now, let's talk about what they are. Judah is the territory that surrounds Jerusalem. So that's what Judah is. In the territory surrounding Jerusalem, God is known. Judah is the area surrounding Jerusalem. Then it says, in Judah, God is known. His name is great in Israel. Israel's pretty straightforward, right? It's referring to the nation of Israel. So in the territory surrounding Jerusalem, God is known. His name is great in the nation Israel. Then we have verse 2. His abode has been established in Salem. Salem is just another word for Jerusalem. Oh, short, like a city. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and then the last part of verse 2 says, His, God's, dwelling place is in Zion. And Zion is the name of the, the temple mount. In Jerusalem. These are all different ways of him referring to his place, his people, his domain. In Judah, the territory surrounding Jerusalem, God is known. His name is great in Israel, among the people in Israel. His abode has been established in Jerusalem. His dwelling place, where God's presence is, is in the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. That's what verses 1 and 2 are saying. And this will kind of come together here as we keep reading. Question 3, what's being described in verse 3? And this is where the context comes in so handy. Verse 3 says, there, so there meaning what we just got done reading in verses 1 and 2. He, meaning God, broke the flashing arrows, the shield, the sword, and the weapons of war, Selah. So, what is being described there? You might not have a specific instance, but you can give an idea of what's being described there. If, if it's talking about Jerusalem, Judah, the temple, temple mount on Zion, and there, God broke the flashing arrows, he broke the shield, he broke the sword, and the weapons of war. God broke uh, what? Are these weapons of the enemy or weapons of uh, people who are allied with God? The enemy, yeah. God destroyed the enemy's weapons. This is just talking about, and this could be referring to multiple different instances, where God has uh, broke the arrows, the shield, the sword, the weapons of the enemy who stood against him. God has defeated, God has delivered out of those. So that's what's being described in verse 3. Again, this is kind of another one of those instances of a recalling of who God is and what he has done, which leads us to praise. And that's the natural response. And that's what we're supposed to do. Um, let me give you a couple of verses on praise that I'll probably bring these up again in, in future Psalm Bible studies. But Hebrews 13, 15. Hebrews 13, 15. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. What is that? That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. So a sacrifice of praise to God, what is that? It's the fruit of the lips that acknowledge his name, and that's exactly what's happening in the psalm. Acknowledging God's name and what he has done. There's also another part that I'd like. Here's another verse, uh, 1 Peter 2. 1 
verse 9. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Why? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So if somebody says, well, why, why would God save you? Why did God choose to save you? You could say, well, because he chose me as his own possession so that I might proclaim the excellencies of him who called me out of darkness into light. Praise. Praise. To recall what God has done. To recall who God is and what he has done. And again, we see that so many times within the Psalms, that it's a recounting of who God is and what he has done, which leads to praise, which has a nice tie into those New Testament verses that we just did. <laughs> Makes sense? Those are good verses to tie in when we're talking about the Psalms. I know we've been in here for a while, so it's nice to be able to tie that into some New Testament uh, truth as well. Question four. Read verses four and six. Okay. Uh, glorious are you. More, who's glorious are you? God. More majestic than mountains full of prey. The stout-hearted were stripped of their spoil. They sank into sleep. All the men of war were unable to use their hands. At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both rider and horse lay stunned. So we remember the context of verses 1, 2, and 3. Nothing has changed. We, ha we have nothing has changed the context. So we're still talking about the exact same things that we were in verses 1, 2, and 3 when we get to verses 4, 5, and 6. So what's being described in each of these verses? We can go verse by verse. In verse 4 it says, glorious are you, meaning God, you're more majestic than mountains full of prey. What, what does that mean? <laughs> oh, I mean, does anybody talk like that anymore? <coughs> oh, you're so much more majestic than mountains full of prey. Uh, we don't talk like this anymore, but in the time of the psalmist writing this, this would be a very poetic way of saying that God is majestic. God is awesome. Um, he is just describing, hey, glorious are you, Lord. You're more glorious than the attackers. You're more majestic than mountains full of prey. Now, a little bit more straightforward is verse 5, where it says, The stout-hearted were stripped of their spoil, they sank into sleep, and all the men of war were unable to use their hands. So if you can't use your hands, you are helpless. This is what, so when God, in verse 3, when it said, God broke the flashing arrows, God broke the shield, he broke the sword, and he broke the weapons of war of these enemies who came against him and his people. And then it goes right into examples of that in verses 4, 5, and 6. God is glorious. The stout-hearted, even these brave men who were so stout-hearted, they were stripped of their spoil, they sank into sleep, and they were unable to use their hands. And then verse 6, at your rebuke, at God's rebuke, when God stood up and acted, O God of Jacob, that's a mention of, of in reference to God being the God of Israel. Okay, Jacob and Israel are one. O God of Jacob, both rider and horse laid stunned. In, in other words, God, God's rebuke stopped them right in their tracks. They're, they're stunned. They, couldn't, they didn't do anything. It doesn't say, oh, you negated their attack by 50%. No, they, they, they couldn't use their hands. They were crippled, and both rider and horse lay stunned, stopped in their footsteps at the rebuke of God. Does that make sense? Again, this is, and you can see why this would, this would be praiseworthy. This is praise. No one can say this but God. No one can say this but God. No one can be praised for these things but God. What was verse 5 again? What's that? What was verse 5 again? <laughs> verse 5 is that the stout-hearted were stripped of their spoil. They sank into sleep, and all the men of war were unable to use their hands. So what's that saying? God, if you can't use your hands, you're frozen, frozen crippled, <clears throat> useless, unable to fight. And this is all because of God. That would be the, an important note in verses 4, 5, and 6. The one who's being praised and the one who's, who's doing all this is God. It's not God and Israel. It's God. 
and, and let that be a, a, a lesson, right? In all things, it's God. It's not God and me. Like, I can't look at salvation and say, well, here's the exception. I mean, this is the exception. It's God and me. All throughout the rest of Scripture, though, it's all God. But this is the one exception where it's God and me. Like, no. God, it's always God. He's always the one who gets all the glory, honor, and praise, Ephesians 2. So, we good on four, verses 4, 5, and 6? All right, let's move on to question 5. Read verses 7 through 9, okay. But you are to be feared. Who is to be feared? God. Why? What did you just get done reading? He will cripple you. He will make the rider and the horse both stunned and fall asleep. You won't be able to move. How are you going to stand against God? So, but you are to be feared. Who can stand before you once your anger is roused? From the heavens you utter judgment. The earth feared and was still when God arose to establish judgment to save all the humble of the earth. Selah. Let's break those verses down one at a time. God, by the way, like God cannot be overstated. We can't overstate God's awesomeness as the cosmic ruler of all things. right? We can't overstate his love. Remember we talked about Hesed love last week. You can't overstate God's love. It's just steadfast and amazing and deep and you just cannot overstate it. You can't overstate God's power either. It is on a scale that is indescribable. You can't overstate his, his power. You can't overstate his love. You can't overstate his justice. You can't overstate his holiness. He's just on scales that are off the scale. His readings are off the scale. You cannot possibly depict him. Uh, you can't over depict him. <laughs> He's just beyond our depiction. Uh, so verse 7, Indeed, uh, you are to be feared. So what's being described in verse 7, that you should fear God, that the enemies should fear God. Who can stand before you once your anger is roused? This is God's fearsome and awesomeness on display here. He's imposing. <coughs> Who can stand before you? You think of Job. Job is sitting there complaining, right? And then God decides to answer him, well, in his own way. And what happens when Job just puts his hand over his mouth, like, whoa, I, sorry, I should not have said anything. Yeah, he got took to the woodshed. You know, God took him to the woodshed. And God never did tell him why he allowed Satan to do those things. God never gave him an example. God never said, sorry, Job, I was just doing this thing on the side. He never, God never gave him a reason. God doesn't owe us a reason. He doesn't have to. Just that he was God. How did he answer Job? He answered Job by, by his characteristics and his accomplishments. He gave him a list of, of why he's God and Job is not. And so, a very humbling experience. So who can stand before God? Well, nobody. Nobody can stand before God. Especially when his anger is aroused. Uh, so this is a warning. This is a warning. Uh, verse 8. From the heavens you uttered judgment. The earth feared and was still. So God is, is what? He's J-U-D-G-E. He's judge. He's What's being described? God is sovereign. God is all-powerful. He's the judge. You should fear him. He's the one who holds your fate in his hand. If he's the judge, when you, if, if, you're in, if you're in trouble and you've been locked up and you go before the judge, you are fearful of that man because, or that woman because they hold that power over you to dictate what's going to happen with your life. Well, there is no judge like the living God. You know, so he is to be feared most of all because he's going to judge against those who are against him and his people. So better not to be against him, better not to be a foreign invader, uh, better not to be uh, people who attack his people, Israel. You know, that's not going to go so well. Just saying. People who are attacking Christians now and persecuting them and killing them abroad, yeah, unless they repent, it is not going to go so well for them when they stand before God at the great white throne judgment. They will, they will be um, witness to God's terrifying power as cosmic sovereign ruler. And you dared attack his bride. Like, be afraid. Be very afraid. 
Not only will he pronounce judgment, he'll, he'll pour out that judgment. He doesn't make other people do it. He'll do it himself. What about verse 9? When God arose to establish judgment to save all the humble of the earth. Another way of humble of the earth would be to say all the afflicted of the land. <coughs> in other words, those of the lands that we've described earlier in verses 1 and 2. Anybody who's been afflicted by these evildoers within that land, those people of God, God will rise for justice. He will enforce justice. He will make sure that everything comes to pass. No one's going to get away with anything. And there's a certain amount of this that is directed towards Jerusalem, Zion, Judah, so there's a there's a specificity a, a specificity yes specificity whatever you know what I'm trying to say there's a specific <laughs> region that's being talked of but as we get to the end of this psalm you'll notice how it opens up to more end time talking where it talks about all princes all kings so then this judgment and this this terror that will be poured out on those who are against God isn't just for those who come against Israel. It's again, or against Jerusalem, or against Zion. It's going to be against anybody who comes against God and his people, period, no matter where that is. Uh, that, let's get to that. Question six, where, what does verse 10 mean? Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. The remnant of wrath you will put on like a belt. Now this could be a confusing verse, but it's not as confusing as it seems. Um, when... What starts out bad turns into something good. So surely the wrath of man shall praise you. The remnant of wrath you will put on like a belt. It's another way of saying that the, those who are against God and his people are railing against him, but that will be turned to worship when God brings the wicked down. So what, when the wicked are or railing against God, or railing against his people, that will eventually end, and it will turn to praise. When God brings the wicked down, his people will praise him. The wicked will, will stop praising, the wicked will stop railing, they will stop seeming as if they're on top, and instead God will be praised because he will bring those wicked people down. So, you know, another way you could phrase it is when it says, surely the wrath of man shall praise you, you could say, surely the wrath of man shall turn into praise for you or of you. The remnant of wrath you will put on like a belt. God's in control. He, he does with it as he pleases, like a piece of clothing. Question seven. What are the final four thoughts of this psalm found in verses 11 through 12? And this is where it opens up. We've been talking specifically about Jerusalem and Zion, and we've talked about Judah. Now it's going to kind of be opened up, right? Psalmist says, starting in verse 11, Make your vows to the Lord your God and perform them. Let all around him bring gifts to him who is to be feared, who cuts off the spirit of princes, who is to be feared by the kings of the earth. That's everybody. That's, that's every ruler of the earth should fear him and everyone who's below them. So if we were to break that down into four final thoughts, we could say this. We could say, make your vows and keep them because you're dealing with God, the cosmic judge, the ruler of all. Make your vows and keep them. That's what verse 11 says. Make your vows to the Lord your God and perform them. In other words, whoever you are and whatever you've done in the past, stop what you're doing and make sure that you're being obedient to God. Serve him. Put your faith and trust in him. Why? Because he is the judge. He is to be feared. No one can stand before him. Everything we've listed <laughs> all the way up through all these other verses in Psalm 76. Those are the reasons why you should make your vows and keep them to this God that we've been talking about in Psalm 76, because you're dealing with him. That's who you're dealing with. So it's definitely a sense of, of seriousness there. 
There's another thought that comes right after that. Let all around him bring gifts to him who is to be feared. <coughs> this isn't talking about, um, you know, God is to be feared. He is the judge of all. He is the one who uh, no one can stand against. So, you know, um, I hear he likes jelly donuts. Bring him a box of jelly donuts. Or I hear he likes, you know, an extra 20 bucks in the giving plate on Sunday. Or this isn't the kind of, of gift that's being talked about. Your life is the gift that's being talked about here. God is to be feared, so you should give him your life. That's the gift. Let all around him bring gifts to him to be feared. So then the question is, if God is God and I should fear him, I should want to know what it is he wants, right? I mean, say you knew nothing about God, but you knew there was a God. You would say, Okay, uh, I don't know anything about this God, but I know there is a God. What is it he wants? Because I'm not him, and he holds my pathetic life in his palm of his hand. I should find out what he wants and give it to him. That's the idea of the second part of verse 11. I should find out what it is he wants and give it to him. And in this way, it's expressed as a gift. But... I should want to find out what he wants. What does he want from me? Obedience. Faith. Praise. Worship. That's what he wants. This would be the point, you know, where you could insert the gospel from Psalm 76. What does God want? He wants what I can't give him. He wants, he wants me to be sinless. He wants me to repent. He wants me to... Give him everything. I can't do that. I'm not sinless. I'm not holy. I'm not, I'm not able to be sinless and holy. And God knew that, which is why he sent his son Jesus Christ to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And by putting our faith and trust in him and his works, that's where we're forgiven. And we're given his righteousness instead of our own. So he gives us his righteousness, so therefore our righteousness is perfect. He clothes us in his righteousness, takes upon himself our sin. And that is how we're able to do that. So that's where you can insert the gospel there. The third one, let's go to verse 12, who cuts off the spirit of princes. God is God, and he cuts away or does with uh, those who oppose him, whatever he wants, even if they're princes. That's what this is saying. God is the one who cuts off the spirit of princes. God is God. He does as he pleases, even to princes. And you have to remember, back in the time of the psalmist, right? A prince had near invincibility and could do whatever they wanted, right? So the, ca the common person would look at a prince and be like, well, who can tell a prince what to do? I'll tell you who. God. God can tell a prince what to do. God is above any governmental ruler or leader. He can tell a prince or a king what to do. That's how fearsome God is, that even princes should tremble at God. So a commoner reading this would be like, wow. God really is God above all. Wow, that's, yeah, he is. And then you have hope. So God is God. He does away with those who oppose him, even if they're princes. Pretty good thing to praise God for. And the last part of verse 12 says, God is who is to be feared by the kings of the earth. This just adds on to the thinking of princes. That God is God. He is to be feared even by the kings of the earth, even by the most highest ranking people with the most power on all the earth. Think of, think of whoever you want. Think of Alexander the Great. Think of any past king or present king or, or president. God, they, God is to be feared even by those who have the most power, prestige, money, fame. God is to be feared. So those are the final four thoughts. Make your vows to God and keep them because you're dealing with God, the <coughs> judge of all. Let your life be your gift for God because he is to be feared. You should ask yourself, if God truly is the judge of all and the cosmic ruler, you should be asking yourself, what is it he wants? And that's what I should give to him as a gift. God is God. He cuts away or does away with those whom he wishes, who are against him, even if they're princes or kings. God is to be feared even by the greatest of those on earth.
That's it for Psalm 76, short and sweet. Any thoughts or questions? Questions. Selah, what does that mm -hmm. mean? So Selah has two different meanings. Selah can mean uh, pause, or it can mean meditate on this. And it, ha it, it can have a musical connotation, as in pause, like musically speaking. But it also has that non-musical meditative connotation, which is dwell on this, think about this, meditate on this, yes. And so sometimes you have a very clear rendering where, oh, when it says Selah here, it's most likely meditate on this deep thought. Pause and really let this thought sink in. And then other times it can be both meditative and it's for the, the choir master. This is a point where you would pause the music, you let the people have that moment to sink in, and then continue on. So it has both those meanings. <coughs> yes? Um, 